Okay, so I'm very excited to introduce and to have Bonnie Cisneros come uh, talk to our class today. She's a fourth generation Tejana educator and a line of South Texas teachers. I actually met Bonnie through online social media world because she's also an artist and creates jewelry and she's also a writer. Uh, Bonnie holds a creative writing MFA from Texas State University, is a member of the Mofondos Writers Workshop and was awarded a NALAC grant, which is the National Association of Latino Arts and Culture, uh, grant in 2018. She also moonlights as a DJ and spins all vinyl sounds. She actually will be playing records at the event on Sunday. So Bonnie, thank you for making time to come to our class. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mendoza. Thank you for um, having me. Thanks to the students for being here. Um, I know that it's a really like, it feels like a very heavy, like precarious time in the world right now as usual, but like even more so. And so I feel very like um, a bit emotional and a bit like um, just really grateful to be here with y'all, you know, talking about what was what could seem like something frivolous when it comes to like the grand scheme of like what's going on in the world, but also it isn't frivolous. It, it's it's part of um, women's history, women's culture. And so I'm really like excited to show, to share with y'all my, um, my ideas and my thoughts and hopefully inspire y'all to um, think about style and fashion and ancestors in, in a little bit, bit of a different way. So thank you for being here. Um, um, I, told, I told Dr. Mendoza that I'm gonna kind of like go through my presentation um, kind of quickly in my slideshow, because I'd like to get to the point at like at midpoint of the class where we can like talk and have questions and discussions and ideas and kind of bounce ideas off each other. So that's the goal. Um, I'm going to start with a quote by Gloria Saldua that I found in her book, Light in the Dark, Luz in lo Oscuro. And I feel like it really sums up like not just this project, but a lot of my projects. She writes, you look for an image pattern that will point to a framework that could contain the organized whole. When you find the conducting thread, llegas a la historia como llegar a un templo, exaltada, ex, exaltada temblando. So I feel like the form of this um, presentation, it took me a long time to find that thread, but um, when I found it, I was indeed like kind of shaking and excited. I'm very excited right now too. So I always wanna open up with, with Gloria's work. Um, let's see. Oh, there's a quote there. Um, Happy Women's History Month 2022. It's a great honor for me to be here with y'all today as a Tejana, the daughter of Tejanas and the mother of two Tejanitas. As far as I can reach back, the women in my matrilineal line have lived in the, these lands called South Texas, uh, at least seven generations. My mother made a leap of faith in the 1980s when she brought my sister and me to live in the big city of San Anto in hopes of a better, better educational opportunities. And though she may not have been cognizant of it at the time, to alter my destiny in the city that has given me everything. To be presenting my work again at UTSA is more than just a cool gig for me. My grandmother who moved to, um, with us to San Antonio back then earned her BA in psychology from UTSA when she was in her 50s. And my mother earned her bilingual teaching degree at UTSA when she was in her 40s. This is an institution that shifted my family's academic legacy and I'm proud to be on the other side of the podium here with y'all today. I would like to thank the university and the Department of Women's Studies for this golden opportunity to share knowledge and inspire thought amongst our community, especially Dr. Sylvia Mendoza for entrusting me with leading her class today to be given this platform again a year after presenting on archives, altars, and auto historia is a gift I do not take for granted. Um, and, and these presentations for me have been a way for me to learn how to, that I can, even though I'm not a classroom teacher anymore, I can still teach um, on my own terms and in my own style. Speaking of style, today I will braid together research and Ansaldu and auto historia to get us thinking about the ways in which we dress ourselves to express cultural identity how we adorn ourselves as a form of ritual and self-care, how we remix vintage and thrifted textiles to create Tejana Rasquache style, how we follow and forecast fashion trends as exemplified in Latinx, for lack of a better term, music stars such as Selena, Kali Uchis, and Cardi B, and how all that adds up to how we express cultural beauty and joy in a lineage of South Texas ancestral aesthetics. I'll get to it more at the end, but I must invite you now to consider submitting a photo of one of your stylish ancestors whose flair for fashion is immortalized in a formal portrait, snapshot, or photo booth image. If you want to participate in this project, please come out to our community, community event this Sunday, March 13th at Hymas Place on the West Side from 2 p.m. to 5, 
where noted photographer Antonia Padilla will take your portrait. You can wear a family heirloom. There's Antonia there. She's also taken photos of Selena in her time. So you'll be part of that energy too. Um, you can uh, wear a family heirloom or an, an inherited garment or a piece of jewelry or even something in homage or in honor of your beloved ancestor style. Because both portraits will be published in an archival zine designed by Ana Karen Ortiz Varela with an introductory essay by me. I had to go extra on this one. When a door is opened, I have this, you know, I learned during the pandemic that if the door is open for me, I need to go around and like open all the windows and let some fresh air into. Um, we talked about Martha Cotera last time I was here um, with Dr. Mendoza's class and um, her quote that says, one's access to power determines one's presence in the archive and one's presence in the archive shapes historical knowledge, which in turn informs a system evaluation that structures the priorities that govern collecting and preservation at institutions. So in other words, this presentation is just the lead up to the real work, um, which is the archival zine. Our moms, our, our abuelitas, our tias, our madrinas, the zine will be printed and published online. I do imagine your ancestors delight knowing that they're still being admired as a style star of South Texas. I really think they'd be so proud to see how far you've come. And um, our personal style is more than how we dress. The clothes we choose influenced by time, place, trends, imagination, and budget can also be a way we create intergenerational cultural identity. In South Texas, style can be passed down through the generations, both as inherited items of adornment, such as rebosos and jewelry, to the creation of unique aesthetic looks inspired by iconic femme familia. Our style lineage is embedded in our photo albums, closets, and jewelry boxes. So just really quickly right now, um, if, and if some of you I'm sure thought of somebody already, like a, a, a fashionista or a style icon in your family, if you wanna put their name in the chat, for us just to like get their energy in, into, our, into our conversation, you can go ahead and do that now. But first, I need to tell you about my own matrilineal line. I've been thinking a lot about my mother's 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 mother, Dolores Ayar Sagoitia Ansaldua, because of a daguerreotype portrait of her that my grandmother had hanging in her house for as long as I can remember until it disappeared a few years before she died. So if you look up there in the corner, you can see Dolores. My grandmother is the center of our line. That's her there in pink. There are three generations before her and three generations after. Her influence on me is both literal, we look the most alike, and my face is like a copy of a copy of hers, and spiritual. Her love of books, art, and beauty is an inheritance worth more than a tower of gold centenarios. But also, pero like, it's complicated too. She battled mental illness, she fought demons, she abused substances and hurt her children too many times to count. But I'm here to excavate the good pile of cositas she left behind. I'll start with her Levi's. Embroidery is remembering. Word by word and stitch by stitch, my mothers gave me stories and skills that I in turn gift my daughters. Storytelling and sewing, preservation and meditation. When we create, we are continuations of all the projects that our mothers and abuelas undertook. It, each creation is an intergenerational collaboration. My grandmother went through an exceptionally prolific creative period in what she would definitely consider her heyday, the early to mid seventies. The trauma she endured at the hands of my grandfather, a man damaged immeasurably as a teenage medic in the Korean war is still ongoing in their descendants. But the ephemera she left from a black folder full of neatly typed poetry, several pieces of her embroidery, some jewelry and clothing sifted from her vast archives are clues to who she was and what she deemed important. My grandmother's sense of style was always one of her passions. She was proud of her looks and took care to adorn herself in the latest styles with a penchant for drama, lace, velvet, leather, and tapestry. She liked to make things prettier, embellishing whatever she saw as too plain with tassels, tufts of netting, and fake flowers and plumes of puppy paint. I think that was one of the hardest parts of dismantling her apartment a mere three days after her death, three days after her death, taking down those faded yellow tool buttresses, the plastic iridescent beaded curtains from the doorways, the spray of fake magnolias shaped into archways, the things she collected and arranged in a way that made her world bearably beautiful only got in our way as we worked to clean up everything she left behind. Her closet. For being such a pack rat, I will always admire how neatly she managed to keep her belongings, her dresses, the long gauzy florals from the 90s, 
the lace and velvet witchy ones from those mystical catalogs she adored, the pleather minis from her wannabe biker chick phase. Our, grandmothers taught, our grandmother taught us the importance of style. She showed us how to thrift and put outfits together. In my heart, she's Suzanne from the Leonard Cohen song, forever wearing rags and feathers from Salvation Army counters. File, file, new baby, new year. My mom and I marvel about how glammed up she is in this photo, but it doesn't surprise us. Of course her hair is done and her makeup is perfect nine days after giving birth. I see a dress that isn't nursing friendly. I see her jewelry, red lipstick. I see my mom, a tiny baby who would have a baby, me, a mere 16 years later. When you heal yourself, you heal your ancestors too. This project is a part of a healing. And even if my grandmother isn't here, I know that this work is like finding a lost earring or a dot of clear nail polish on a run in one stockings. The pair is together again. The damage will freeze in its tracks. In a book called Shawls, Crinolines and Filigree, the wills of women in New Mexico from the 1700s show that women of means would catalog their possessions, their inventory of goods left at the time of death. So items such as pulsera de corales, Santo de Plata, Sábanos de Algodón, Espejo, Comal de Fierro, Medias de Seda, Anillos de Plata. My grandmother left no such declaration or itemized list of her belongings, which she so cherished in life to guide us as to what she wanted to go where and to whom. We were left aghast and overwhelmed, picking apart the museum, now mausoleum she'd lived in, vacated and left us to disassemble. I brought home some of her dresses, a stack of books she always had on display in the glass cabinet called the secretary with the secret desk that would pull down. All of her paper archives, including photos, letters, cards, and souvenirs from her travels. After she died, I could no longer wear, wonder where I got my style from, nor from whom I had inherited my sentimental bookworm and pack rat archivist heart. She left no will, but has passed to me a willingness to preserve and build upon her archives. Okay, y'all ready for a beauty secret? Books are the greatest accessories. The more I dig into my great grandmother's stories, the more I realize that literacy in English tambien and a deep ancestral love for libros really are the greatest inheritances they could have given us. Today, I will be referencing these texts that you see on the screen, but I had to show them to you because I think they make an aesthetic altar of sorts. Also, I must express gratitude for the work that supports and uplifts my own. I was so pleased to read and uh, the book Mexicana Fashions, edited by Hurtado and Cantu, in their introduction, quote, we trust that the contents of this book will ignite further exploration into the significance of fashion, self-adornment, and the economics of self-fashioning among Mexicanas, as well as women of color whose femininities and sense of style have not informed or been informed by the mainstream fashion industry. When my grandmother died in April, 2019, it took me months to even dream about creating again. I'd escape into the Latino collection and resource center at the San Antonio Public Library and pull stacks of books on topics related to her, fashion, cooking, music, and other border pleasures. I'd read and photograph pages out of these rare books and sometimes allow myself time to draft. I see now that I was trying to figure her out, her out by reading and figure myself out by writing. Here's a little of what I wrote. In 1822, Texas is no longer a colony of Spain. It's part of the Republic of Mexico. By 1846, Texas is no longer Mexico, rather the 28th state of the United States. Quote, women's fashion ceased to be exclusively Spanish in design and style. Gradually, they became modified by influences from the US. Lace mantillas made way for cotton bonnets and the Guarda Infante morphed into the bustle. After the present border was established and the steamboat and railroad opened South Texas, styles were affected by outside influences. Yet as late as the 1970s, my mom recalls valley fashions and trends as being a couple of years off. My grandmother would jaunt north to hip cities like Austin and Houston and return with her car trunk overflowing with the latest bell bottoms, mini dresses and platform shoes. She'd drown my mother in new clothes as if to say, I know you missed me, but look what I brought you. I became enamored with books from the collection that document jewelry. and costumes from various regions of Mexico and began to dig around the art of filigree jewelry. Before we move on, um, there's this famous quote by Coco Chanel. I don't know if many of y'all know it. Before you leave the house, look in the mirror and take one thing off. That was her like little fashion advice. And sometimes I find myself doing that, but since today I, I didn't actually leave the house, 
I didn't do that. And like, I, I just left everything on. <laughs> um, so I became enamored with the jewelry books, the books, especially that, that talk about the art of filigree. Filigree jewelry is a quintessential colonizer adornment with roots in ancient Greece, India, and Egypt. During the Middle Ages, Spanish Moors further developed the art and eventually it made its way to the colonies. Filigree is um, ornamental work in metal formed into delicate scrolls, net, and floral motifs. So if you've seen earrings like this, this is an example of um, some pretty typical me Mexican style of filigree earrings. Um, I like to look at these books and learn new lyrical vocabulary that I would read to myself out loud like a weirdo um, to get a feel for the ornamental palabras like aretes and sarguillos, which are earrings, arracadas, earrings with pendant, coquetas, long dangling with jewels, pendientes, eardrops. I also found the so-called wiggly fish um, that is an ancient jewelry design from India. Um, it's a lovely little ornament made of funnel-like sections loosely telescoped together and held by fine wires and the scales engraved give a glistening surface and the movement perfectly recreated by the construction. So these, there's these little wiggly fish that like actually, um, they're, they're designed in a way that emulate the movement of the fish. Um, I can't read about the design without thinking of the wiggly fish on a gold chain that saved my life one day in Colonel Summers Park in Portland, Oregon, where I sat with my friend on a Mexican blanket under an ancient Douglas fir on a cold, sunny summer afternoon. I was 2,075 miles from San Anto. I'd plucked the orange enamel fish from a bowl of trinkets for sale in a shop on Hawthorne. The way it wiggled caught my eye and I thought it would look fetching on a chain around my neck. That summer, I often wore the fish with my sundress and I would find myself playing with its segments, making it dance between my fingers and contemplating its structure as I rode the bus to a substitute teaching gig or sat alone in a darkened movie theater. Little trinkets like the wiggly fish became touchstones for home. That day, C and I sat on that blanket absorbing the sun like only people whose skies have been covered in clouds for months at a time can. Across the expanse of dark green grass that I can only describe as velvety, a group of men were playing Frisbee. C and I stretched out and stared up at the blue sky like people who had the entire day to explore desires and enchant themselves in the particular way that Portland afforded. Natural beauty, creative distraction, cheap pleasures. Every day felt like the middle of a long weekend. He reached up and to stroke the side of my face and I looked at him with my abuela's sad eyes and a frisbee shot through the air with the sound of a spaceship and pummeled me right in the center of my chest where my wiggly fish's puffy tail was crushed flat and left its impression like a fossil on my skin. One of the men came over to retrieve their toy and found me crying, incredulous and angry. It was an accident, he spat. We didn't mean to hit you. But you did, I said, and look, my fish saved me. He sort of glanced at the flattened fish tail, furrowed his brow and walked away with the frisbee. I told C I wanted to leave. He must have thought I meant the park, but what I really meant was Portland. I guess what I'm trying to say is that jewelry holds memory. It makes sense that a fish was an early popular design because I can imagine that the ancestors who wore them were connected to the land and water in a way that we have forgotten. The wiggly fish reminds us how we depend on the water, how we honor the fish for feeding us, how we see jewelry as more than trinkets, how it all means something. Showing your colors. My research stopped me in my tracks when I found books on Mexican folkloric costume. I was so excited that I shared some of these images to my social media and someone immediately commented, but why are they white? And I replied, because of 500 years of colonization, question mark. I look at the drawings and I look at my own backyard self-timer portraits and I wonder what my style will say in 500 years. And um, there's this Princess Nokia song, Bal Balenciaga, that like kind of sums up my, uh, my thrift mission and uh, energy. Sketchers looking like Balenciaga, thrift clothes looking like the Prada, whole fit lit, it cost me nada, blank, blank, blank. We won't say that part. Dress for myself, I don't dress for hype. I dress for myself, you dress for the likes. These texts I was referencing had lines which I copied down such as Mexican women, young, old and young, rich or poor, wear earrings. Practically every baby girl's ears are pierced and have little gold rings in them. And from then on, she is never really dressed without her aretes. Many women I know feel powerful in their hoops. Earrings en enhance style. <clears throat> they make a statement. They attract attention and they top off one's look. 
To be lost in books about women's style helped me hone in on my own aesthetic creations every time I left the house. This is a mere sampling of my earring empire. A lot of these are handmade by um, artists in town. Some of them I made, but this is just a little mood board of earrings I wanted to show you. In Mexicana fashions, Dr. Josie Mendoza, I'm sorry, Dr. Josie Mendez Negrete writes, in the accessories I wear, Rebozo's earrings, bracelets, and necklaces, I carry a remembrance of these women and the gifts they gave me. I honor every one of them who has been part of my formation and as I make visible the creativity of my people. For many of us, the first time we see um, traditional Mexican styles is in the classroom. Our professors wear their culture to give cues and look cute in the process. So I just wanted to shout them out. Um, as a young teacher, I made a, made a point of wearing Mexican embroidery and beaded jewelry, but not all the time. Um, this is me in a dress that I bought in high school at Solo Serve that um, I would wear to teach eighth grade. Um, I'm gonna kind of skip ahead a little bit um, to the idea of rascuachismo. I had only heard the word rascuache hurled as an insult or teasing jab, but the work of Dr. Tomas Ibarra Frausto in his seminal often quoted essay, Rascuachismo, a Chicano Sensibility, sums it up. To be, to be rascuache is to posit a body consciousness seeking to subvert and turn ruling paradigms upside down a witty, irreverent, and impertinent posture that recodes and moves outside established boundaries. This is my mom um, on a dump dumpster dive. is like a before and after. They would find like really good stuff in the trash and then they go to the pulga and sell it. It was one of her eras, one of her um, hustles growing up. Um, in Jillian Hernandez's Aesthetics of Excess, she writes that heavy makeup, gaudy jewelry, dramatic hairstyles, and clothes are often considered cheap, fake, too short, too tight, too masculine. Working class Black and Latina girls and women are often framed as embodying excessive styles, and they're presumed to indicate sexual deviance. She notes that this marginalizing view can be traced back to European colonialism, where colonizers would encounter people they deemed less intelligent and whose aesthetics were vastly different. She writes, there is a history to why certain ways of putting the body together are viewed as tasteful or not tasteful. <clears throat> um, we can look to music artists who are always at the vanguard of style to see um, examples, Selena, Caliucci's, Cardi B. They present us with aesthetics that can be seen as excessive or distasteful too much. In her book, Costumes of Mexico, Chloe Sayer quotes um, a Franciscan friar named Sa Saagun. Um, he's known as the first anthropologist, and he described um, the Aztec harlot in the 1500s. Quote, she appears like a flower, arrays herself gaudily, anoints herself with axon, a waxy yellow ointment. Her face is covered with rouge. Her cheeks are colored. Her teeth are darkened, rubbed with cochinil. Half her hair falls loose, half is wound round about her head. She arranges her hair in horns. She perfumes herself, casts incense about her, uses rose water. She chews chicle. She promenades goes about laughing. I also think about Diana Vreeland's take on it. She says vulgarity is a very important ingredient in life. A little bad taste is like a nice splash of paprika. We all need a splash of bad taste. It's hearty, it's physical. I think we could use more of it. No taste is what I'm against. There's a lot to unpack here, but I wanted to give shine to this Rasquache, um, these icons whose styles are nuanced and layered. As Ibarra Frauso writes, in the realm of taste, to be rasquache is to be unfettered and unrestrained, to favor the elaborate over the simple, the flamboyant over the severe, bright colors preferred to somber, high intensity to low, the shimmering and sparkling over the muted and subdued. Um, and then um, the gift of thrift, or how I learned to stop worrying about my size, my age, what people think, and just have fun with style. These are just some examples of garments that I thrifted over the years and put together in various ways um, to create um, unexpected looks. I have stuff about, a lot more stuff about thrifting, but I'll move ahead to my Tejana grandmothers and Thea's were glamorous examples of beauty and style. They used makeup, they had fashionable hairdos, they just dressed themselves with great care and what I hope was pleasure. Um, 
In the mode of costume of 1942, Ruth Turner Wilcox wrote, the wearing of clothes being a necessity, the individual owes it to himself to display in the front he presents to the world the most pleasing exterior possible, artistic in color and design, charming and flattering according to the fashion and the circumstance. And they were so pretty. I like how my grandma chose the off the shoulder Mexican dress. Her love for that style never faltered. And later I even used the ruffle of one of her blusas to border the framed collage I made for her funeral even prettier. So there's so much I wish, there's so much more I wish I could show you and tell you. I could go into the gold coin bracelets and how a National Geographic post of a girl from the Oled Nail tribe of Algeria sent me into a research tizzy connecting my grandmother and her Mexican coin bracelet to the original belly dancers of North Africa with their coin belts. How that made me think of Bia's whole lot of money where she says, I put all my jewelry just to go to the bodega and I keep it with me. So just so that I'm feeling safer. I could get into the world of fat fashion. Oh, just really quickly. This is one of the photos I found of um, one of these women from Algeria. And then this is a photo of my grandmother. And I'm like, they look so much alike. And uh, that's a whole other, whole other presentation. Um, there's her bracelet. So um, I could get into the world of fat fashion and the movement to hashtag degender fashion, the fashion archivists online who seek to uplift style stars who tend to be forgotten. But time is tight and I will leave you with a list of local and mega style sister stars I follow that keep me inspired and in awe of their beauty, visions and generosity. Um, I'm sure you, those of you on social media, I'm sure you have style uh, fashion accounts that you follow. You can throw them in the chat and we can sort of add to our list because now, the ball of yarn is in your court. Um, when I think about this project that we're about to um, make together, I think, who am I gonna submit? And I'm pretty sure I'm gonna be submitting my great grandmother, the queen, AKA the queen of my heart. Um, and I'm thinking about either this photo because her hair is just out of this world or this one, which is her and my great grandfather, um, Sam and Bebe before the war in the 1930s. I just love that. They look so happy here. Um, these are other things from my archives. Um, Samuel's mother's wedding dress on display in Hidalgo County. Um, so all these fashion things that I have um, in my archives that I, I need to put together. Um, but I think that for the zine project, this is probably gonna be the picture I submit. Um, these are the books. These are just, this is just a, an abridged um, list of references um, of, some of the research I did, more earrings from my collection. And I just wanted to say um, that I know that not everybody can trace back seven generations and has inherited their grandmother's, you know, archives and whatever, whatever. But if you're down here, you know, and you have your parents and you have your grandparents and your great grandparents and on and on and on, just because you don't know their names or you can't, you know, see their photos, they're still part of you. I just wanted to like, put that out there. And also side note, chosen family is family. So if you feel like you have a photo of someone who's not technically biologically related to you, but they are your style icon, please feel free to um, submit their photo and include them. Because this is um, our, our zine is gonna be called Style Files, Ancestral Aesthetics of Sananto, Ayer y Hoy, right? The siempre is not so much because it's like, the ayer is your ancestor, the oi is you now. Um, the Ana Karen Bar Ortez Var Varela designed our poster and she's also gonna be designing the zine for us. You can all see she's extremely talented. So I'm really excited to see how she puts the zine together. The portraits by Antonia Padilla um, are gonna be part of this. Your ancestor's photo is gonna be part of this. And I'm gonna include a short essay um, as an introduction. Um, for those of you who don't know what a zine is, I included a little definition here. It's just a small mag self-published magazine, um, handmade usually um, in small batches. Um, in order for us to understand the assignment, um, please submit a favorite photo of one of your fashionable ancestors um, to me, bonniecisneros at gmail.com, the subject line is style files, by next week. Um, attend our Pisces Soul Sunday, which is taking place this weekend. You can have your portrait taken. We ask that you wear something that represents your ancestral style. 
It can be literal. These were my grandmother's earrings. I'm wearing them. Or it can be spiritual. My favorite Thea loved purple when I'm wearing purple. Or it can be metaphorical. When Selena wore the cow print bolero jacket, I was influenced to embrace my rasquache ranchera aesthetic. So there's a lot of ways you can go with this. The two photos will appear side by side in the zine along with your responses to the following questions. Who's in the photo? When was it taken? Where? As many details as you can provide. And how does this photo inspire your sense of self and your style? So I will, those are the, the it'll be almost like little captions for the, for your page. Um, yeah. And so I just wanted to like, again, once again, shout out my abuelita. This is her bedazzled love cap <laughs> that I brought home with me. Um, and uh, dedicate this to all our stylish ancestors and their descendants who adore them. And that's my presentation. <laughs> and I think we're good on time. So would like, um, yeah, let's open it up to questions. I know Dr. Mendoza asked you all to come up, come with questions. Uh, maybe something I said sparks, uh, you have a similar story or something you want to share or a question about the project, whatever you want. Let's, um, we, we can open it up now to talk. Questions or comments, reflections, something you want to share. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if like the more she learns about like her culture and like her ancestors and her style changes like over time. So did you hear that question? Yes, I did. Um, I feel like it did. Like when I was talking about like when I was when I st first started teaching, like in my early 20s, like I was very much into um like I was saying, um making a point of wearing things that I considered like the Hana or Mexican, right? The embroidery and the, the jewelry. And like, I felt like I was like sending like cues, like it talks about in the book, like sending signals to, especially my bilingual students that like, I was like, we were connected somehow, right? Though that's what, at least that's what I hoped. And another thing, like, like I would, um, I always dressed up like, when I was a teacher and then like when I worked at a nonprofit, like I always, I pretty much for the most part dressed up because my great grandmother who was a teacher, she always wore dresses and heels and like the whole, you know, earrings and everything. She taught for 55 years. And um, I feel like that was a way of showing like kind of um, showing them that I cared. Like, like the minute they walked in the door, they knew that I was here and I was like ready and I was professional, I meant business, you know? But after time, like learning more about like, learning more about like my matrilineal line and learning more about my roots, I think it kind of changed where I didn't feel, this is weird and it's something I'm still like grappling with, but like, I didn't feel certain items like were mine to wear anymore. Like in terms of maybe the, the things that were more like kind of strictly like indigenous, like I was like, that's not really cool, but it's not that that's not somehow part of my um, identity also, but I just didn't feel right anymore. So it's kind of like the opposite. Um, the more I learned, the more I like embraced the whole like remixing of styles, taking on thrifted things and, and, and putting them together in a way that was like unexpected. Like the older I got, the more I did, did that, I guess. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Other questions? I saw some meme about like, just saying like, instead of saying like any other question saying, I'm not gonna move on until there's another question. Oh, well, Ali has a question. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's something that like, and I never was conscious of it, but like, um, I always, my mom, I guess is more of a, she, she's not so much like a frilly, like into all that kind of stuff. She's more like a tomboy or whatever. And so from her, I learned about like wearing, um, like Western, like the pearl snap button shirts. And so like, I definitely, um, feel like 
I thrift in the men's section too. Like I wear, I wear men's shirts. Um, and then like botines, things that are more masculine. I definitely like some days just feel like, you know, um, putting on a pearl snap and a pair of boots and like a pair of hoops. Like for me, that's masculine, but like, I, I feel like it's also like, um, it belongs to me too, because like my Theos and my father and my grandfather, like I like to dress like them also. And that's a really interesting, that's a really interesting point that I didn't like, that I can definitely add to my, to this project, which is ongoing, but like, I, yeah, I do. I definitely wear more masculine stuff sometimes. I think you mentioned she had uh, a daughter or two daughters. So I was mm -hmm. like, um, you kind of like teach them or like kind of help them with their style and kind of figure out what I guess they like. Yeah, yeah. Um, my daughters are nine and six. And um, I've been thrifting for them since before I even got pregnant, you know, because I always knew like, I mean, I was I hoped and I knew that I would have girls. So when I on my thrifting, you know, journeys, I would find like little girl dresses and all kinds of stuff, vintage stuff. And I would I'd start I started squirreling it away a long time ago. And so when, once they were born, and once they started being able to like, dress themselves, um, they have a lot to choose from you know so like it's really cool because now we're at the point where they dress themselves like they pick they pick it's so cute because we have like play clothes versus the stuff that's hanging in the closet and they're really good about like putting things together you know because like I would say like 95 percent of their clothes are either hand-me-downs or thrifted because if you know about kids they grow through stuff so fast there's no reason to go buy new stuff right so like they they put together these combinations of things that like I find I get, I, I guess I get a real kick out of it, you know, because they do like, they enjoy it. They, um, we don't thrift as much now, like post well pandemic times, but like before, like they would, um, they'd come with me like, and like pull something out, you know, and like a few times, like I remember, like they've pulled out some really cool stuff. So yeah, it's definitely something I'm passing down to them and, and we're hoping that they, that they like continue to like embrace, you know, throughout their life, but they do love, they like dressing up a lot. I have a question. I have a 13 year old, and what advice would you give a parent of a child who she's really commercialized? Um, you know, she likes Abercrombie, and you know, her style is that kind of style of what she sees on TV. To what advice would you give to kind of help them influence them into seeing all these other artistic forms of, uh, you know, dressing and style? Yeah, you know, that can be so hard because, like, that age, it's so like there's such a pressure to conform right and we all we want to be like our friends we want to be like we want to fit in um and so that's a very like it's a very precarious age but um somebody who's already kind of like i mean it's hard i guess i guess the main thing for me would be just to try to like expose her and show her like different um just different people you know and like that could be anything from like looking at old movies my mom showed us a lot of classic movies when I was growing up and like of course the fashions are like really you know outstanding um taking her to thrift stores you know because a lot of the times like whatever's hip right now it it was hip 20 years ago and that's what's in the thrift stores right now so even like getting her excited about finding that whatever it is they like you know if it's the, 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 the early 2000s fashion is back right now, go have help her find something in the thrift store. So at least that like little spark of like, you can find a version of this that nobody else has, you know? So like, maybe that will help, could help her, you know, see fashion in a different, in a different way, you know? Yeah. I just bought her some mom jeans. I guess that's what they're called. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I yeah. Yeah going old school she said <laughs> yeah yeah and there's a lot of vintage vendors now you know that like they have little they have markets and stuff and they they curate according to like you know their their aesthetics so it's really cool to see their racks and like yeah like she could definitely like pull something and there's that feeling of like nobody else has this you know like everybody has a certain shirt from the mall but nobody else is going to have these mom jeans you know so I think that that's a good way to kind of get her like get her interested in it mm-hmm Mm -hmm. Anything else? 
Um, yeah, so I wanted to ask, like, how does the hyper visibility of, you know, these, like, aesthetics of the excess and um, non -normative, like, uh, the aesthetics of non-normativity kind of open up people's bodies to violence, right? Like, how does it, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, in terms of, like, the white supremacy and, and heteronormativity, like, how do these, these structures uh, able to subject these people's bodies and their aesthetics to open their bodies up to violence? How does it expose them to, did you say violence? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, how did the aesthetics possibly open up the potential for folks to react in violent ways to? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you're pretty much wearing like a, you know, kind of like a, like it, 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 aesthetics can can bring attention to yourself, right? I mean, that's part of it, because like, once you put it on, you're not seeing it, right? Everybody else is seeing it. So it's like, you're, what, what you put on display can have, um, can, can kind of trigger, I guess, certain people. Um, and in terms of the aesthetics of excess, like there's a lot of like negative connotations that can come from seeing someone and, and dubbing them, you know, excessive or too much or whatever the word is that, you know, that they're going to use for it. Um, but like, I don't know, like, I feel like so many, of, so much of the time, like, aesthetics of youth like especially like young black and latina um culture like gets co-opted by the mainstream or by you know and and then it like becomes acceptable right and we see that with a lot we see that with a lot of the celebrity culture like you know at one point these like really you know long ostentatious um nails were considered this and then all of a sudden you know the kardashians had them and now they're considered high fashion right um and I don't know, I mean, I don't know the answer to it. Like, I don't know, like, I guess, I mean, I wish we lived in a world where, you know, women could dress how they chose and not be put themselves up, you know, for, for judgment or ridicule or even violence. But like, I, I, I don't think it's, um, like, I think it's a battle worth, worth fighting. You know what I mean? And as, as for me, like, I feel like I'm, my excess is in a different way. And me being like a woman, me being of a certain age, me being of a certain size, like, I feel like this dressing in certain ways, like some people just don't approve, right? And I, and I set myself up for judgment when I walk out the door sometimes, but like, I, I don't think I, I, um, I don't know, thinking about violence or thinking about ridicule, like it's never been, um, enough for me to stop, I guess. So I don't know if that, I don't know. Like, I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. And I hate that we have to like, you know, think that way, but. You did include in your Instagram folks to follow about Sal Alok, who will actually be reading uh, the following week coming mm -hmm, back, mm -hmm. who does talk yeah. about, um, we'll be reading the book Beyond the Gender Binary, but there are, um, they have talked about on Instagram, like, stepping outside as a non, um, as a gender non-conforming person, right? And experiencing like literal violence for wearing a dress, right? Or for wearing like X, Y, and Z that doesn't fit into a, a, a gender binary. So that's kind of like how I interpret in here, like um, mm -hmm. before signed weekend. I think, yeah, there is a lot for us to like learn and explore with that. So thank you. Yeah, I've learned so much from following, by following Alok. You know, and I, I love the way that they um, sometimes post, like somebody will write something really ugly, comment something really just, just so mean and ugly on one of their photos. And then the response, you know, like they'll post their response and it's always like putting it back on the person, mm -hmm. you know, which is so true because like, if you see someone, you know, who doesn't conform to your, you know, gender norms, wearing something that doesn't conform to what you're, you know, the way you think, you know, people should, whatever, whatever rules they should adhere to. It's not really a reflection of that person. It's a reflection of you, you know? And I think that's, that's one of the like main lessons that I, I, I take from, from um, Alok's work is that like, this isn't about Alok. This is about the person who, who's just so, um, just so triggered um, and, and feeling so bad. And I don't, and I don't think it's about, I think it's about themselves, you know, like it's not a, really about a loc who wears a dress. It's about you, the person like reacting in this way that there's something in there, you know? Um, so it's a really, it's a really like 
there's just so much, so much to learn, you know, um, which is why, like, I, I, I learned so much, um, from these, these like fashion, like style accounts. And even though they're not technically like, they're not, you know, style influencers or whatever, but they do share their style and they don't really conform sometimes. And there's so much to be, to, to learn from that, you know? Anybody else? Anything about the project? Are you all interested? Are y'all gonna submit? <laughs> Are you gonna come to the event? Please come. <laughs> I was thinking of coming to the community event where we'll be a community and where you will be showcasing your own style as a nod to whoever you consider family style. I just told my wife not to make plans for Sunday. So, <laughs> so yeah, yeah a family day. Yeah, yeah, and like, mm -hmm. go ahead. How would you describe your style, Luke? My style? Boring. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a reason for that? Or do you feel like called to present boring or? I just grew up without much, so I don't have much. And I like to live with enough to fit in a suitcase in case I ever need to move someone. So uh, I don't have much. Uh, the clothes, the new clothes that I do have, my wife usually gets it for me, mm -hmm. but she gets frustrated that I always wear the same thing. Thank you for sharing your, your methodology behind the reasons that you put forth for your style. Any others want to share about your style? how much you could hear I know that there's a yeah, I heard a little bit um I feel like I mean college is like such a perfect time to like kind of you know you you grow up and you're kind of under the wing of your of your of your family and their their norms and their expectations you know you grow up part of that you don't even most of the time don't think of it until you get to college when you're like okay who am I and like you start thinking of different you know different ways of expressing yourself or whatever and I feel like not just, you know, I feel like with the pandemic also, I think a lot of us kind of just saw the, just, uh, just sort of questioning things, you know, like, I know I started questioning like, like certain things that I'm like, wow, you know, um, this is, this might be TMI, but like, I stopped, I stopped shaving, you know, under my arms, um, when the pandemic hit, cause it's like, kind of like, well, who cares? What's the point? But like, I never, I've never gone back 
you know, and like in my whole life, you know, I'm 44 years old. I had never done that. I had never, I didn't know what it was like to have hair under your arms. And like, when I, when I step back and think about that, I'm like, that's so weird, you know, like what a weird, like norm that I just followed since the age of whatever, 12 or 13 and never look back. And then all of a sudden I'm like, no, why am I doing this? You know? So I feel like I, um, I, I'm hoping that, you know, um, the pandemic and, and, and everything that's going on in the world has kind of like opened up some like people's eyes. And it seems like such a minor thing, you know, but for me, it was a, it was a daily thing that is no longer, um, part of my, part of my aesthetic, I guess, you know? So I feel like, um, that urge to shave your head or, wear whatever you want to wear, you know, like it can be, it can be like, it can, you can necessitate some like bravery because there, there came a point like when the lockdown ceased and I went out and I was wearing a sundress and I'm like, oh shoot, I'm wearing a sundress. Like what, you know, kind of like, it was different for me, you know? So there's a, there's an amount of like, there's a certain amount of like <sighs> bravery you have to have, but you also have to just, you know, like just believe in yourself like I'm not if someone's gonna judge me based on this or that that's not the kind of person I even want to be associating with so why do I even care what they think of me just because of this you know minor non-conforming detail you know so I don't know if that was too much information I felt a shift too with pronouns even during the pandemic I was like I think they make sense for myself but I think it was something that with the absence of like judgment or like the threat of like violence, right? Like mm -hmm. it feels a little bit safer in quarantine, right? To kind of like explore that part of your identity. Uh, but yeah. then like, out, yeah, there's a there's an impact. So yeah, that's yeah. about the pandemic and like what you uphold and what you don't uphold or what shifts um, and what changes. Right. Like I remember um I went downtown and I was wearing shorts like kind of like after the lockdowns, you know, loosened up a little bit. I'm like, am I, am I downtown in shorts? Like, who am I? You know, because like all my life, I, ne I never would have dreamed. And like, it's such a weird thing to say, you know, because like growing up, I was, I was overweight, but I, you know, whatever. And I, st I would never have dreamed, you know, of wearing shorts downtown. And the other day I was, I caught myself doing that. And I'm like, wow, I don't really, you know, I don't really care. And it's part of it is having to do with, you know, when you get older, you know, all those kind of um, rules for yourself kind of slip away, but also, you know, like, I don't know, um, going back to the other question about violence, you know, I was, it wasn't even so much like I was embarrassed. It was more like I was scared to wear shorts downtown, which says a lot, it's not even about me, about the society we live in, you know? How long did it take you to feel comfortable what, to the point where you didn't feel like anybody was looking at you or uh, felt judged or felt like, uh, you know, people were, you weren't normal or normal like everybody else expects? I don't think I've, I don't think I've completely gotten there, you know, like, I don't know, like growing up in the certain, in this society, it, it's hard to ever get to that point, you know, um, but at least to be able to do it and not and not feel um, petrified, I guess. It took me like, what, 40 years? <laughs> Allie? Do you think that the students uh, have they tried to ancestors? What was that? Do you think tattoos have a tie to ancestors? Um, yeah. I mean, they definitely have ties to many cultures, right, around the world, um, and a lot of significance and sacredness to um, a lot of different cultures around the world, um, and also are part of aesthetics, you know, like, when I was a kid, you know, when I was y'all's age, I, tattoos were very rare, um, and if, if someone had one, they had it in a place where it could be covered, you know, like, um, in public or whatever. And then as, as, you know, in my teen years and onwards, they started getting very, very much more um, sort of the norm or, or more acceptable, I guess. But definitely like piercings and tattoos have like long been used um, for aesthetic and, and sacred purposes, you know, 
um, throughout human human history. So yes, definitely. And I feel like the, the urge to do so, like whatever it is, like my fascination with hoops or someone else's fascination with um, tattoos or shaving their head, I feel like that comes from somewhere before, you know, and maybe you'll never be able to like pinpoint where, but somewhere like when we looked at that chart of the ancestral like tree, like I feel like there's always some spark somewhere before that has you fascinated with a certain thing, you know, because we're just programmed. We're kind of like our DNA has got just information from the past, right? So I feel like our interests were sparked somewhere before. So that idea of tattoos, like maybe was there somewhere along in the line, you know, with the person who's, who's infatuated with them now. Like kind of like memory before memory, you know. How would you describe um, San Antonio's aesthetic if you had to kind of like put a description on, <laughs> on it? I mean, there's so many, there's so many like, I think like um, sub, what is it? Uh, subcultures. I feel like there's so many subcultures, but like one of my favorite um, subcultures, especially like growing up, like in the nineties, you know, is the, like one of the, uh, this is, I'm not going to say it's my favorite subculture, but I don't know why it's the one that came to mind right now, but like, and I know it still exists, but like the kind of like um, South side metal, <laughs> uh, rowdy, like, black t-shirt like I don't know like I don't even know what you call that but to me that's a quintessential Sananto like aesthetic you know that I that I um feel really like I have like fond feelings about um what else I mean there's so many what's one of yours Dr. Mendoza what do you think what do you what do you think of like a sub sub genre um, I, I guess I'm familiar with like a West Side aesthetic, right? With like eyeliner and mm. lipstick and um, yeah, just like a certain sensibility. Yeah. Yeah. That's another, another fave. Yeah. Um, the, the hair, you know, the, um, the bangs, the like really ornate, like the hairdos I could never do, you know, <laughs> um, oh, I tried, um, and the the shrimp earrings, the nameplate necklace, um, the brown liner, brown lined lips. Um, yeah, that's a that's a really um, important. I think a quintessential San Antonio aesthetic. The Selena hat. Yeah, Selena's sense of style. <laughs> the hat. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Selena sense of style, which, which by the way, like it's as interesting to see, like as the decades go on, how much her style is like influences um, pop from all genres, not just, you know, certain genres, like her style has really like, and a lot of her style came from um, a, like the La Squatcha thing where she was making her costumes herself. They were making their costumes, but also like she admired, like I know Janet Jackson for one, you know, so she would like look to Janet Jackson and these other icons and then sort of remix and make her own version of it. And she made it in her own way. And then you can see, you know, it's influenced to this day, you know, which I really, which is really amazing, you know, because her, her, her career was so brief, you know, it was such a bright flash and then gone, you know, but she was never really gone though, you know? Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. I'm not sure if there's questions in the chat. I know we have folks who are also logged in to- Oh yeah. The chat, let's see. The flyer, the tattoos, how long did it take? Um, brands. Oh, and then I'm going to go ahead and replay your email, bonyacisneros at gmail.com. Yes. And then we're asking for the, for the photos to be submitted by March 16th. That gives you about a full week 
to figure out um, what image and, you know, um, just the best quality image you can take, you can have. I know not everybody has a scanner at home, but if you're going to take a photo of a photo, just make sure like it's the best possible, the clearest, crispest, you know, uh, most crisp photo you can take of it um, to submit. Um, and then those questions that I had, um, let me get those one more time. Um, for the ancestor photo, it's just very, just basic stuff. You know, who is it? When was it taken? Mas o menos. Um, where do you think? And even it could be like, it was, it, it was in San Antonio in my grandma's house in her kitchen. You know, like it can be very like basic, but as much as you, as much detail as you can give. Um, so there's the, there are the questions that you can include in your email. Um, and then how did they, why did you pick it? You know, why, why did you pick this certain photo? How does it inspire you? Because that's going to be the little, in, the little caption on your, on your page. Um, and again, like this whole thing about, you know, making the zine is like, I have this, like, this, like gut feeling, like wanting to, um, <coughs> excuse me, just preserve ourselves, you know, like preserve, preserve our, our, where we come from, who we are. Hold on, you need a cough. <coughs> Sorry. And zines are a way to do that, you know, and I know a lot of the institutions are collecting zines and shout out to um, St. Susia and that whole crew for really like <coughs> inspiring, sorry, directly inspiring me to like document, preserve, publish, distribute um, these, these, these zines that, um, that hold our culture, you know? Um, so I really do hope that a lot of you are, no, there's no charge to the photo. Um, um, a lot, I hope a lot of you like submit, you know, um, because I think it's going to be a very beautiful, if you, if you like the poster, Anna Karen's poster, like, I think the zine is just going to be just as beautiful, you know, and we'll have free prints of the poster too on Sunday. And, a, and an art, um, Bulga, including one of your, um, one of your colleagues, Viviana is going to be vending. She's a seamstress and a jewelry maker. Um, so you can do some shopping, have a mimosa, go some nachos. <clears throat> well, thank you so much, Bani. We're so grateful for you to share your time and your research about um, what it means to, you know, express yourself through your style and how it's connected to our ancestors. So thank you again. Yay. Thank you for this opportunity, Dr. Mendoza. You really like, I mean, I don't even know. Like, I'm, I'm so, I'm so grateful for you and your students. And like, I really hope that like y'all just, you know, next time you're getting dressed, just, you know, I don't know, throw on a little something extra. Why not? <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. All right. Well, I'll see you on Sunday. Okay. See you all on Sunday. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. I was so nervous and now I feel so much better. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll see you then. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye.